People and animals have always been dependent on one another for survival. During the Middle Ages, the furred, feathered, and fleeced lived side by side with humans in towns and cities. Some were welcomed, others not so much. In the Middle Ages, humans needed animals to feed themselves, and they were an essential part of both urban and rural life. The sight, sounds, and smells of livestock, both dead and alive, would have been an everyday experience for most people, as they provided dairy products, leather, wool, and meat. Horses and donkeys were used for transportation and haulage, and cattle were essential for traction power. And nothing was wasted as animal bones were boiled up to make glue, and animal fat was used to make tallow for candles. Although some animals were only ever meant for the dinner table, others were domesticated and kept as companions. Pack and riding animals were very important in medieval life. The presence of wild animals and vermin was a challenge, and towns had to find ways to protect themselves. Let's travel back in time now to find out about some of these beasts and how they formed an essential part of city life. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Medieval knights were some of the most ferocious and well-known figures of the Middle Ages. Well-trained, merciless, and always kitted out with the best equipment. And if they lived today, I'm sure they'd subscribe to today's sponsor to get a monthly membership delivering a box of awesome, just as incredible as they are. Of course, we're talking about Bespoke Post, today's sponsor that provides top-shelf goods from under-the-radar brands. Bespoke Post is free to join, and you can control your subscription by skipping a month or cancelling whenever you want. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based in the US. Every month, Bespoke Post sends out incredible new products including survival gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, and even oysters, depending on what you want to have. And not even the most well-known medieval knight would have had access to such amazing products. Each box of awesome contains about $70 worth of goods, but you only pay a fraction of that value. You can choose to preview your box before it's shipped, so you can choose to keep it, swamp it, or skip it. The lineup changes every month, just like the knights in a medieval tourney. As the boxes change each month, each one comes with an amazing range of products. And the boxes even change each month based on a preference quiz. The iconic Weekender box contains a hardware and carry-all that helps you pack for a weekend away with ease and in style, even big enough for a knight to pack his gauntlets in. The other box that a medieval knight would appreciate is the Terror, a box that has a versatile award-winning field knife, a detox scrub bar to clean at the end of the day, and a bird call to attract songbirds. So, to get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in our description and enter the code MEDIEVAL20 at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com slash medieval20 to get 20% off right now. And now for today's video. Wild Cats and Wolves and Bears, oh my. Many towns only had partial walls to keep the predators out, and some had no walls at all. Even for those that did, this wasn't a guarantee of protection. As urbanization flourished across Europe between the 11th and 13th centuries, new towns sprang up and existing ones grew in size. Sometimes the residents spilled out from the city limits and created suburbs around the perimeter. Being in close proximity to the more rural spaces of woodlands and forests, these places were the perfect hunting grounds for a whole range of ferocious animals. From these smaller wild cats, which were often hunted for their skins, to much larger carnivores like bears. It's most likely that wolves were attracted to the smells of animal waste and any leftover stock from shops and stalls within urban areas. The stink of discarded animal entrails, skins, and rotting food would be so bad that it would easily travel over the city walls and reach the outside areas enticing the predators. In two northern cities of France, wolves penetrated the boundaries. In 1400, Evreux was under siege for marauding wolf packs, while in 1445, it was Rouen that had wolves prowling around the town walls, and it was the alderman who was responsible for repelling the scavengers. The areas surrounding Paris were used for royal hunting, and on several occasions, during the early 15th century, wolves ventured out from the woods and into the city's outskirts. There, they attacked people and consumed their bodies. In Britain, during one devastating incident, which happened in the town of Carmarthen, South Wales, a rabid wolf got in and bit 22 people. Traditionally, the last English wolf was killed in northern Lancashire in the 14th century. In 1340, the Benedictine monk and English chronicler Ranulf Higdon, who lived in a monastery in Chester, noted that there were few wolves left in England. The last known set of instructions on how to trap and kill wolves was published in 1289. After that time, wolves could only be found in the highlands of Scotland. A Dog's Life 
The Book of St. Albans, which was printed in 1486, is a compilation of interests for medieval gentlemen. It lists 14 different types of hunting dogs, many of them recognizable today, such as setters, terriers, greyhounds, and spaniels, called this because they are thought to come from Spain. One variety is listed as the Butcher's Dog, which we can assume was some type of large mastiff breed as it was used to control livestock, and for bull baiting, which was seen as both entertaining and important to produce meat. Feral dogs, known as prick-eared curs, were a menace on the city streets and were known to scavenge for food along with pigeons and other vermin. In London, there was a ditch that ran along the outer walls and moat of the city where animal corpses were dumped. Many of them were dogs, and it's thought that this is where the area of Houndsditch in the East End got its name, either from the dumping of dead dogs or through the dogs that foraged through the mounds of rotting waste there. Pets were a luxury that few people could afford, although in the late 1200s, Arnulf Muttony, a London resident, owned three greyhounds. Some people kept guard dogs such as Isabel Este. Her dog, along with its chain, was valued at 20 shillings and four pence when it was stolen from her in 1305 by Johann Koo. He claimed that Isabel had given the dog to him, but he would gladly return it as long as she promised to feed it. Large mastiffs were also kept as guard dogs at the London Bridge House, and city officials kept their hunting dogs in kennels near Moorgate, overseen by an officer called the Common Hunt. In a law passed in 1217 known as the Charter of the Forest, anyone caught poaching would not be subjected to the punishment of having their hands cut off, as was common during the reign of King John. The perpetrator was given a fine, and their poor dog would have its paw lopped off instead. A few wealthy ladies did keep spoilt pups, and many of these cherished pets, described as gentle hounds, were even memorialized on seals and graves. The tomb of Margaret de Neville depicts her holding a small dog in the bend of her left arm. In Bishopgate, London, a carving of the late wife of John Osterwich shows her with two chubby little dogs wearing belled collars. The 13th century German bishop and philosopher Albertus Magnus believed that these sort of lap dogs often died of constipation because they were so pampered and overindulged. In 1387, anyone who allowed their dog to wander around the streets of London causing, quote, noise, damage, and debate was liable for a fine of 40 pence. And by 14 in 75, butcher's dogs were permitted to roam around freely as long as they were not a bitch in season. But they were always going to be occasions when tragedies occurred. In 1366, compensation of 20 shillings was paid to Walter Boldswell when 54 of his sheep died after being worried to death by a dog owned by a man named Adam Poulter, who deserves to be shamed here 700 years later. This Little Piggy most of the cities of Europe were full of pigsties and cattle barns. Bred purely for food, the fact that pigs could be fed on just about anything and grew quickly meant that they were a popular choice for the majority of people who had little money. Pigs were inexpensive to keep and provided meat that could be easily cured for later use. Nothing was wasted from trotters to brains. But like dogs, roaming pigs could become a dangerous menace, especially if they became too large to handle. By the start of the 14th century in London, pigs had to be kept in gardens or yards and were not allowed to roam freely. If caught, a pig could be legally killed and confiscated and the owner would be given a fine as a consequence. Nevertheless, many towns were infested with wild dogs and pigs and there were often culls and men were hired in an attempt to try and eradicate them. The aldermen in London tried to clean up the city streets and hired official swine killers to whom they paid four pence for each pig carcass that they removed. In 1354, after the Black Death in Norwich, England, there were so many pigs in the streets that gardens and buildings were damaged and, quote, children killed and eaten. In London, it was only the pigs belonging to the Hospital of St. Anthony that were allowed to roam around freely. The chronicler John Stowe described them as wearing little bells and following those who fed them around faithfully while squealing for more treats. These scholars at St. Anthony's became known as Anthony's Pigs. Similarly, the academics at St. Paul's School became known as the Pigeons of Paul because so many of the birds nested and flocked around the cathedral precincts. Swanning Around the River Thames runs through the centre of London and is home to a lot of wildlife. Although there are many swans on the river today, in the Middle Ages, thousands of them could be seen on the water. The secretary to the Venetian ambassador commented in the winter of 1496 that, quote, it is a truly beautiful thing to behold one or two thousand tame swans upon the River Thames. Traditionally, mute swans belonged to the monarch, but the king also gave private individuals and institutions the right to own and mark their swans. Between 1450 and 1600, this meant that up to 630 different sets of cut marks were used on the swan's beaks to identify the owners. When Robert Beeknor died in 1365, he left two of his swans to his stepdaughter and another pair to his friend Robert de Luth. Feeling a little horse. 
All medieval cities needed horsepower to function, whether that be the cart horses that hold large quantities of grain, wool, or wood, without which trade would have simply come to a standstill, or the elegant palfreys preferred by the upper classes, the genet horses bred for walking with the ladies and pilgrims, or the all-around rouncy riding horses hired from inns. This equine workforce had to be looked after, and this created an industry in itself. There were farriers needed to take care of hooves, tanners for saddles and other tacks, smiths for horseshoes, stable boys at inns, and even bakers who baked horse bread containing peas, oats, and beans to feed the animals. Despite being only fit for horses to eat, this cheap bread was often used to sustain many people during times of famine. But all of this horse and donkey traffic had two huge downsides. Not only did they make the narrow streets congested, but they also created huge piles of manure, which caused a lot of complaints. Horses could be bought and sold on Fridays at Smithfield Market in London, and the dung that was deposited there after a day of sales was mountainous and unwelcomed by the local shopkeepers. The citizens of London could also hire a horse and cart when they needed to move goods around. In 1479, many of the carters would queue up along the riverfront from Billingsgate to the Tower, waiting for jobs. The problem was that they would often abandon their horse and cart to go to the alehouse when work was slow, and there were often a lot of complaints about their behaviour. So, official hiring stands were put in place at Tower Street, Tower Hill, and East Smithfield, like modern-day taxi kiosks. A whale of a time. Swans might have been plentiful on the River Thames, but the arrival of whales and other large marine mammals was much rarer and always a cause for excitement. Technically, whales were the property of the king, but because they were such a valuable resource of meat, bone, and oil, they were eaten by everyone in the locality when they were stranded. A whale that became stuck in the river between Greenwich and Norfleet in 1336 was quickly spirited away by a group of Londoners before any royal agency could be recognised. And a whale was chased and caught at Mortlake in 1240, and in 1392 a dolphin was seen at London Bridge. During the mid-15th century, there appeared to be a mini-invasion when in 1457 two whales were caught between Erith and the city, along with a narwhal, or swordfish, and a walrus. On occasion, the king would grant rights to institutions when it came to ownership of any aquatic creatures that were washed up. Henry I allowed St. Paul's Cathedral the rights to any cestacians breached on their land, except for their tongues, which the king wanted as it was a highly prized delicacy. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. If you have a dog, make sure to give him a pat from me, and I'll see you next week for another episode. Cheers!